As night begins to fall in Oxford, we start our Evensong at Home for the fourth week of Hillary term in the front quad. Here is the front quad with a rainbow flag flying over the tower and lights glowing in the windows and in the archways and also on the college welfare cat. So you can see that college is alive. There are people here, although it's very, very quiet compared to a normal Hillary term. George Herbert's collection of poems, which we have been looking at this term, is entitled The Temple. It was published shortly after his death in 1633 by his friend Nicholas Ferrer. So here we are in the dusk outside our very own temple, Wadham Chapel. The first poem in the sequence is called The Church Porch, and we have two church porches, actually, at Wadham Temple. Here's the main door, and here is the side porch. The next poem in the sequence is called The Church Lock and Key, and we do have a very fine, very large lock and key on the door from the 17th century, which takes an enormous iron key. Next up is the church monuments, and of course we have a very fine collection of monuments of all shapes and sizes in the chapel. Now we might think that what Herbert was up to was just creating a series of poetic pictures of parts of the church. An ekphrasis, which was a standard literary genre. But Herbert is doing much more than that, and he has a much more metaphysical aim than that. He's not just describing the church so that we can see it. He's describing the church as an allegory of the human soul. Because the temple that really interested Herbert was not so much the magnificent monument of carved wood, of carved stone and soaring vaults and arches. What really interested Herbert was the temple of the human soul and what we make of that. Another poem in the sequence is called The Church Music, and this gives me an excuse to show you what a magnificent pipe organ we have. Magnificent both in looks and in sound. And indeed, what other pipe organ in Oxford or maybe even in the world has its own mermaid playing a trumpet in the front of it? As Herbert continues to take us around the church, he brings us up to the altar, which is famous because in the typography of the poem, the words are laid out to form an altar. So we are going into the dark chapel to our altar. Our altar table is a glorious Jacobean table with carved legs, turned bulbous legs. It's actually called a melon bulb, which is a Jacobean specialty. Whether it's going to be light enough for you actually to see them is another question. You may have to trust me on this. There are the melon bulb legs on the Jacobean altar table, which may have originated as a dining table. Last Sunday, we talked about the windows, which are now face fading out to a lovely indigo color. Makes you feel a bit as if you're inside an ice hotel because everything fades out to this lovely luminous blue. And when the great east window is lit from behind, all the turquoise comes to the far and you really do feel as if you're in an ice hotel. Today's poem, which we will hear talked about by our DPhil student, Anne Ang, is the church floor. Herbert considers both the familiar black and white checkerboard marble church floor, such as we have, and he also talks about the rougher stone 
of the outer vestibule of the church. And it makes a very interesting contrast between the polished marble and the rough stone. In addition, in our antichapel, we have enigmatic carved letters and numbers scattered seemingly randomly across the stone slabs. There are lots of very curly letters, J's and sixes and nines, and quite complicated little bits. So one theory is that the carvers were practicing their letters and their numbers. Here is a lovely R and a W, a six, and some more numbers. So were these simply reused in the antichapel for practice pieces, or are they marking something? They're cut into in, in odd ways. It's a mystery. Some of them, of course, do mark um, people who are buried here, and they commemorate past members of the heaven. So again, Herbert takes us through the parts of the church as a starting point, but it's a bit like jazz. He starts from the basic melody, but then he launches into an improv. He riffs on parts of the church as inspiration takes him, and as uh, correspondences in the life of the human soul are suggested to him, Herbert wants each one of us really to take ourselves seriously as living temples, as temples of the Holy Spirit, of the God of truth, beauty, and love. So welcome to Evensong on this Sunday of fourth week in Hillary term. Pointed for this evening is Psalm 26. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me, test my heart and mind, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I wash my hands in innocence, and go around your altar, O Lord singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. Do not sweep me away with sinners, nor my life with the bloodthirsty. Those in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great congregation, I will bless the Lord. The lesson is taken from the letter of Paul to the Colossians, chapter 3. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness and patience. Bear with one another and... If anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, 
to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thanks be to God.
Hi everyone, I'm here to talk about the church floor for this term's Herbert Fest. And like so many of Herbert's poems, it wavers between or it pivots between the whimsical, um, the imagistic, as well as the spiritually transcendent. And I guess in responding to this poem, I had two questions that I wanted to say a bit more about. Firstly, why would Herbert choose such an aspect of the chapel that would be so unexpected? Um, it is usually the windows which get the heavy symbolic meanings attached to them, so why the church floor? And the second question that I wanted to think a little bit more about was um, the image of death puffing at the door, which I'll get to. But first, we should listen to the poem, which I will read. Mark you the floor that square and speckled stone, which looks so firm and strong, is patience. And the other black and grave, wherewith each one is checkered all along, humility. The gentle rising which on either hand leads to the choir above is confidence. But the sweet cement which in one sure band ties the whole frame is love and charity. Hither sometimes sin steals and stains the marble's neat and curious veins. But all is cleansed when the marble weeps. Sometimes death, puffing at the door, blows all the dust about the floor. And while he thinks to spoil the room, he sweeps. Blessed be the architect whose art could build so strong in a weak heart. So I guess what we might notice at first is that the poem is clearly divided into two parts. There are the first four stanzas, which are allegorical and which attribute a certain value of virtue to an aspect of the chapel. And um, they're fairly traditional in that sense, but also reflective of what Herbert is reported as saying that his poems are pictures that pass between his soul and God. And the first four stanzas do exactly that. They take an image that we might see for ourselves while sitting in the chapel and transmutes it into confidence and, and the idea of the choir being confidence and the organ rising above is something quite inspiring, I feel. Um, and the first four stanzas uh, kind of build up to a, a crescendo, a kind of climax as it were, and the idea of the sweet cement. So beyond or beneath um, the outward appearance of various aspects of the chapel floor, whether it is checkered or not, there is the cement that underlies it all and that is love, which is quite a moving thought to me. But what I'm more curious about is um, if, and this is pure speculation on my part because we are talking about pictures passing to and fro, if, is if Herbert had a particular church goer in mind someone who has reason to perhaps examine the floor and in that moment of distraction um, this particular churchgoer is somehow seen as less focused on the service at hand, distracted, less worthy um, and in a curious way the church floor restores the dignity to being distracted and to seeing that perhaps the distraction has a way of coming back to to the spiritual meanings at hand. Um, and I find there's a deep humour in that as well, which is what I'm going to talk about next with the image of death puffing at the door. The notes to the Penguin edition of Herbert's uh, complete verse um, allude to, think, I mean, make the case that the puffing at the door alludes to the docks that parishioners would have left outside the door of the chapel while service was in progress and uh, those, well, quite obviously the poor dogs uh, would be getting quite impatient towards the end of that service and they would be literally puffing at the door and, and waiting for their masters and mistresses to quick, quick, come on and, and, and let's go and, and, and play in the green because it's, it's Sunday. Um, and it's odd that Herbert would attribute such a mundane image to something so solemn and sometimes morbid as death. And there's a deep humour to that. Um, and even without the notes, the idea of puffing at the door um, takes, a, takes the, the, the fear and, and 
the kind of scariness that we assume with death as, as a spectra to something just um, almost mundane, um, maybe like a magic dragon puffing at the door. So this is what I'm going to leave you with. I wonder if there's a deep kind of contemplative laughter in the poem, a kind of chuckle at death, because what goes beyond death is this inner clarity of perception that allows you to see the art that the architect renders at the heart of the chapel, um, which is in its design and in its very cement that is used to build even the lower, lowliest of its aspects, the floor. Our prayers tonight are recorded on location in Oxford and Singapore. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen. And mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with righteousness. And make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people. And bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord. Because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. O God, make clean our hearts within us. And take not thy Holy Spirit from us. O Lord God, who seest that we put not our trust in anything we, that we do, Mercifully grant that by thy power we may be defended against all adversity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Light in our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord. And by thy great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. Through the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God give us grace to follow his saints in faith and hope and love and the blessing of God our creator redeemer and sanctifier rest upon us and remain with us this night and forever amen, amen.